Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello all. First, let me apologize for my absence. I've been traveling a bunch and sometimes it goes to plan. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't. I apologize for any background noise. Not part of the plan. I saw the trailer. I'm very interested in hearing your opinions on it. These are mine. First, before you even click on it on Netflix, you notice it says coming soon, but doesn't give an exact date. About half of the trailers say coming soon and half give an exact date. The fact that this doesn't give an exact date makes me believe the rumors about their reported fussiness a little bit more. But let's get straight to it. The question the director poses, Why did you want to make this documentary? And the way Harry and Meghan answer this question, both separately and so differently, gave me... A lot of food for thought about their psyches and their relationship. Harry's answer makes it clear that he believes a pack of lies. Quite right. You're a royal, not a reality star. Nobody needs or even wants to know the trivialities of your day-to-day -day existence. Royals have been around a long time. We know the basics of your lifestyle. Seeking the approval of the lowest common denominator cheapens you. Your job, your only job, the job you were literally born to do, is the support of British excellence. It's encouragement domestically, it's promotion internationally. That is not the same thing as winning the world's most excellent Brit pageant. To quote Plato so trite, even Harry must know it, excellence is not really an act but a habit. It has been 83 years since the Keep Calm and Carry On posters were introduced and they still sell them in Primark. Harry, Henry, Henry Charles Albert David, H. Consider for a moment the English honorifics and the virtues they imply. Honor, excellency, grace, highness, majesty. A royal highness is supposed to be very much above the fray. Absolutely no one wants to hear a prince toe the line between explanation and excuse, <laughs> except for evil lovers of schadenfreude like me, who you should ignore. Never explain, Harry. Never complain. Never explain. As for Megan, she's on her usual Socratic method bullshit and answers the question with her own question. When the stakes are this high, doesn't it make more sense to hear our story from us? Firstly, it's amazing how she can annoy me on so many levels with just one of her contrived one-liners. <laughs> Who else feels this way? Everything she says. Oh, she's physically incapable of giving a straightforward answer. I'm not even expecting honesty at this point. I'm just hoping for something said succinctly. And in that way, I think I am exactly like... Prince Harry. I actually think this is the mechanism by which she manipulates Harry day in and day out. He believes he's kind of dumb and she is very smart. He believes this because he realized at a very young age the odds are that the people around him are more intelligent or at least slower to react and therefore better at reaching logical conclusions than he. This idea of himself was established very early in his life, likely first with his brother and then reinforced in school. This is his Achilles heel, not being a bit slow, which can't be helped, but refusing to take it slow when he really should. He doesn't even attempt to compute the content of what people say. He certainly doesn't look for logical fallacies or interpret agenda. He expects other people to do that for him, friends or employees after the fact. He works on recognizing a speaker's emotional appeal and addressing that instead. I'm not sure if he alighted on this method naturally or if it was trained into him by handlers or a combination. But it really flatters him in three ways. Firstly, it's implied that he got the gist of what the person has just said, when I doubt he frequently does. 
Secondly, it looks like he is progressing the dialogue rather than simply incapable of directly responding with an evidence-based opinion or suggestion. Lastly, it reinforces his superiority by not directly addressing a question or supposition. He seems like a royal highness, like he's quite above this level of discourse. Let me show you two examples of what I mean. First, an interview from Afghanistan, 2008. What do you think when you saw those guys in the plane? Um, I, was, I was a bit shocked um, just because, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a bit of a sort of choke in your throat because you know it's happening. Emotional framing. Once you're back from operations, everything's a bit of a nice climax. As in, you go back to your unit and well, there you are, day in, day out, you know, same routine, nothing changes, and that's the way it is. Where at least on operations, you know, you're kept on your toes the whole time. That's what guys join up for, I guess. It's just that, you know, that sort of adrenaline. He's not claiming to be an expert, but he thinks he's got the gist of it. As I said, angry would be the wrong, wrong word to use, but no, I am, I'm sorry, disappointed. Um, I thought I could sit through to the end and come back with um, our, sort of our guys and, and the colonel himself. Um, but yeah, I'm back here now, and I suppose, I think deep down inside, it's quite nice looking forward to having a bath. So I think once I've had a bath, I think it's, you know, it's a nice to be back early, but... I wouldn't say I'm a hero. There's guys, um, one who lost um, two limbs, left arm and a right leg, um, and another guy who was basically saved by uh, his mate's body being in the way and uh, took shot onto the neck, um, both um, out cold throughout the whole of the flight. And, you know, those are the heroes. Those are guys who have been blown up by a mine um, that they had no idea about doing, you know, serving their country, doing a, a normal job, doing what so they know is best. He's progressing the dialogue to the big questions. Yeah, I'd love to go back out. I've already mentioned it, and I want to go out very, very soon. Always our humble, charitable prince. And here in 2010, talking about World Cup. Memorial Prince for England tonight. Yeah. I think it's fabulous about his birthday as well today. I think uh, couldn't be a better present than having him and win these three nils. That's nice. This interview is interesting because it shows the pattern with him is even stronger when he's second fiddling, if you will. Message to the team. Uh, win, win, win. Really, really score loads. No question. No question. Well, yeah, they wouldn't say it, so it's fine. But yeah, I think uh, the win would be fantastic, obviously. Um, but I don't think we should put a, a particular number on it. Uh, I think one nil is good enough. A win's a win. Emotional framing. And how far do you think England can go in? I'm all, I'm all a rugby fan, but when he, I mean, as William says, you know, the, the ball, the altitude, lots of things have, have been um, surprising people, I think. This seems to be a World Cup full of surprises. He's not claiming to be an expert, but he thinks he's got the gist of it. I really hope South Africa get through um, because the atmosphere and speaking to all the, all the kids in the, uh, in the hospital today, um, it's just really nice to see the support. He's progressing the dialogue to the big questions. And um, yeah, England, let's see what happens. Always our humble, charitable prince. This is why he was terrible in school, decent in the army, and actually great as a working royal. In lessons, where content is paramount and delivery is neutral, he likely died of boredom daily. In the army, he could easily follow direct orders and thrived in conversations where he had nothing to prove. And as a working royal, he was particularly suited to the role because not only did he have nothing to prove, being so highly situated in the hierarchy, but he could also deploy his talent for and enjoyment of emotionally charging interactions. He seemed very likable and relatable because his words were merely reactions, not judgments, which he's actually incapable of making. And he made people feel the way they hoped to feel when he felt like. It. This is an important similarity between Harry and Meghan. In their narcissism, they both believe they can incite and regulate specific emotions in other people, including each other. And therefore, they both judge other people on how those people make them feel, not their actual behavior, character, or merits. This is where the gap between their truth and the truth lies. And this is why they can't hold on to employees or friends, it seems. It's not enough to be good or do good. You also have to rub them just the right way every single time, or they'll punish you. Megan plays Harry like a fiddle by combining her meaningless word salad 
with unmissable emotional signals, and then positively reinforcing the reactions she likes getting with physical affection. Harry doesn't realize she's spouting drivel because as a child, he gave up trying to figure out what people meant by parsing their words. He's listening to tone of voice. He's looking at body language. And I'm sure he's really keyed into those things because he's sexually bonded with her. He's happy to catch a keyword here and there. Pity, flattery, telling her she's right and letting her have her way. Get a smile, a held hand, a hug, a kiss, maybe more. He wants those things from her, so he gives those reactions to her, no matter what she does or says. To us, it seems strange that she taps him, pulls him, pushes him, and otherwise physically guides him in space. But to him, those physical touches are a carrot. And if he's a good little horsey, he'll get to eat them later. To the rest of us, it's very off-putting. And I'm sure couples who have dinner with them can become quite uncomfortable with their dynamic. But for them, it's natural. We only see Dr. Megan Jekyll in public, but I wonder if there is a knockdown drag out hide at home. It's one thing I will be looking for closely in this series. It's also the reason Harry still felt like he was Queen Elizabeth's favorite grandson, even after all he'd done to betray her, because he was only reading and understanding her sweet, loving, grandmotherly emotional signals while being habitually incapable of comprehending the actual content of her edicts or the reasoning behind her decisions. That's why he's all too willing to attribute decisions he likes to people he likes and decisions he doesn't like to other people. In Queen Elizabeth's case, courtiers, his father and his brother mostly, but also Camilla, staff, humble servants, and even Kate by extension. I feel very twisted saying it, but I am super curious about how their blame game plays out through this series. And I think that's what Megan is promising us with her rhetorical question based on a false premise. The formula we learned to recognize in her podcasts. As I've just established, no, it's quite unnecessary for us to hear your story from you. Even undesirable, some would say uncouth. But let's examine your sneaky premise. With stakes this high. For who? You're no longer working royals. You do not represent the United Kingdom. Whereas once you could have embarrassed its subjects, your actions are no longer a reflection of them. I dare say many viewers who are Republicans, citizens of former colonies that were harshly treated, and just your average gossip-loving haters will enjoy your show more the messier you get. Your reputation is already trash. To lower it any further would be to dip into true scandal. Really, Harkles, there's nowhere to go from here but up. You're still young. You can secure a legacy that is on balance very good through years of good charitable work. <laughs> Not that I think you will. So if the stakes aren't high for the audience and the stakes aren't high for the Harkles, perhaps the stakes were high for Netflix when they first signed your deal. But at this point, you're a sunk cost. They are not dealing with you ever again. Can we fairly interpret this as another of Megan's veiled threats? It seems the only people the stakes are genuinely high for is the royal family. How much more nastiness will they be forced to endure silently as they do? All right, so now that we've discussed the substance of the trailer, let's talk about the style. There are several hilarious elements, but taken all together, it coalesces into a narcissistic pity play of operatic proportions. Ominous piano music is punctuated with the amplified click of camera shutters, just to remind us how super famous, very glamorous, and incredibly poignant and suspenseful <laughs> their journey <laughs> from Windsor to Montecito has been. Also, rather than using current unseen video footage from the series, they show a blend of very recognizable paparazzi photos from the Harkles' time as working royals and what looks like private vacation snaps from an Instagram account with the black and white filter. They also use random stock photos to make 
London seem really threatening and piles of childhood photos because of course this is Megan and she is willing to go back to prehistory to find excuses for her bad behavior. Now that I say that, I'm actually rethinking the sound effect. Is that supposed to be the click of old school cameras or the click of an old school slide projector? Either way, the vibe is super dark yet nostalgic, like they went through something very, very bittersweet. The problem is when you drill down on these visuals, they were clearly chosen because they're the pictures that Megan looked the best in, not because they show any actual defeat or pain of any kind. Megan, you're crying or pretending to cry or laugh, I have no idea what's happening here, in front of an orchid, a $500 candle, and a $1,700 throw blanket. It will be very, very difficult for people to feel badly for you. This one also really makes me chuckle. <laughs> Could you imagine voluntarily televising your Tuesday afternoon marriage counseling or whatever this is? <laughs> Okay, tell me what you're looking forward to, what you're hoping they reveal in this series. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um.